they systematically deny the existence of all UFOs. A true skeptic would be very useful in the field of UFOs or ufology. Unfortunately, what we're really dealing with in most instances are not skeptics. I'm a skeptic. I check things out. What we're dealing with are debunkers, and they seem to have very little to offer because they're the true believers. They know there's nothing to the subject, so they don't give it any attention. They just make proclamations and charges. So skepticism is fine. Debunking isn't very useful. James Randi isn't really a UFO skeptic. He's a debunker. He knows practically nothing about UFOs. In his book, uh, Flim, Flim Flam, he discusses Marjorie Fish's star map work connected with the Betty and Barney Hill case and gets just about everything wrong. Now, a different kind of skeptic is Carl Sagan. Carl and I were classmates at the University of Chicago. I have no idea why Carl has continued to make foolish charges about flying saucers. His most recent one was that every UFO sighting, when carefully investigated, turns out to be either a fraud or a mistake. The statement itself is a fraud because every large-scale scientific study provides loads of sightings that are neither, that are obviously evidence of intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. UFO witnesses have not only been uneducated country folk, their number includes some very prestigious people. Former US President Jimmy Carter, in the company of some 20 other people, saw a UFO on January the 6th, 1969. He was then governor of Georgia. On the 17th of November, 1986, a Japanese airliner followed three UFOs for half an hour. The pilot, flight captain Kenju Terauchi, one of Japan Airlines' most experienced flyers, described the biggest of the UFOs as being five times the size of a jumbo jet. They changed speed astonishingly quickly, and Captain Terauchi stated that the UFOs must have come from outer space. There are thousands of photographs of UFOs. A controversial pioneer of UFO research, George Adamski, photographed UFOs in the 1950s with the aid of a telescope. Adamski claimed also to have seen humanoids and flown into outer space with them. Skeptics have offered dozens of explanations for this flying saucer picture of Adamski's, suggesting it could be the top of a vacuum cleaner or an ashtray. A photograph alone can never be final proof because trick photography allows hundreds of possibilities. The final years of Adamski's life were tragic. He was branded as a trickster. These pictures were taken by an American couple, the Trents, on May the 11th, 1950. Researchers regard them as some of the most reliable UFO photographs. The target of a furor, at least the equal of the Adamski controversy, was Edward Meyer of Switzerland as a result of his photographs and claims of having had contact with humanoids. Even before his claims were investigated, he was labeled the UFO hoaxer of the century. Meyer claimed to have been in contact with humanoids who were replaced at intervals of 11 years, the same rhythm as the changes in sunspot activity. Creatures from the Pleiades galaxy told Meyer that they were cautious about approaching humans because they didn't want to give rise to a new religion. Maya's pictures show five different types of UFO. The investigation into the Maya case was led by Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens of the United States Air Force, who had studied UFOs since the 1940s. He has a file of 3,000 UFO photographs. I think the question is why do I believe the Swiss case of Edward Meyer is a real UFO contact case? And why do I accept those remarkable pictures as real pictures of UFO? I must say that in the course of the investigation, we found not one photographer, but we found five photographers, five different photographers, all involved in this one case. They all took pictures of the, say, of the spacecraft, the Palladian spacecraft. And on one case, four photographers simultaneously from four different vantage points took pictures of the same craft at the same time and th those were taken on four different cameras four different rolls of film they were processed in four different laboratories in four different countries and they all showed the same objects apart from that we took four 
of the best pictures, one from each of four different cases to the United States with us, where we put them through exhaustive testing, for which more than $60,000 was paid for testing by every known means in modern technology. Now, in the course of testing these UFO photographs, we discovered that we content can continually eliminate a process. We can always eliminate one more process known in phototechnical circles as processes for faking pictures. And we successfully eliminated all known processes of technically producing pictures and end up with something unknown. We do not know how these pictures were made unless they were made in real time, a real spacecraft, as alleged by Mr. Meyer. Tried to learn from the UFO's flying characteristics, which is one reason for the secrecy that surrounds them. Recently, the latest test version of a flying saucer was shown in the United States. In Scandinavia, in the late 1980s, the biggest wave of UFOs occurred in the mountainous area of Hesdalen, south of Trondheim in Norway. The most intensive UFO hunt in history was started, involving Scandinavian UFO research groups, Norwegian universities, and the Norwegian army. The Hesdalen project produced a host of UFO pictures and scientific data on the behavior of UFOs. In spite of the wide array of scientific equipment used, no logical explanation for the phenomena could be given. Study of the UFO's behavior did suggest that they were guided by an intelligence. UFO investigators from Finland, the United States, and France also took part. Among them were Professor Heineck and a French researcher, Jean-Michel. Uh, for my position, it is absolutely uh, beings from outer space who were trying to contact the people there. But unfortunately, there were not enough people ready to welcome there, to talk with them, and also there were been too much uh, people from outside coming to the spot. Therefore, the activity is now decreasing and uh, UFOs are moving southwards on all the places in central Norway and on the, in the mountains. A wave of UFO sightings similar to the Hestdalen episode took place in the Kusomo district of northeast Finland in the early 1970s. Most of the strange light phenomena and sightings of objects were concentrated on the slopes of Finland's most southerly fell called Isosuete. Strange balls of light have been seen in the same area more recently. It's been noticed in many parts of the world that UFO sightings are particularly common in mountainous regions. The reason may be magnetic fields, which the UFOs possibly make use of for their avionics systems. The Finnish wave of UFO sightings in the 1970s inspired an extensive research project which was not supported by official or academic circles. Pudasjärven ufoaallon aikana tutkimme ilmiötä välineellisesti ja käytimme siihen kaikkia valokuvausteknillistä materiaalia, mitä oli saatavissa. Erityisesti infrapuna-alueella kykenimme tallentamaan ilmiöitä, jotka eivät vielä tänäänkään ole selvitetty. UFO sightings occur continually around Finland and Scandinavia. On August the 30th, 1986, the couple Myla and Kalle Koivonen were driving to their summer cottage for the weekend. When they'd parked the car and were walking towards the edge of the lake, a series of events began which turned the Koivonen's view of the world upside down. Tulimme rantaan ja astuimme veneeseen, kun vaimoni huomasi taivaalla valon ja sanoi, että sieltä tulee lentokoneja. Vilkasin sen taivaalle ja samassa näin lähestyvän sieltä valopallo, joka silmissä suureni ja pysähtyi noin 30 metri korkeuteen venemme yläpuolelle ja oli läpimitaltaan noin neljä metriä. Minä kysyin Karlelta, onko se helikopteri? Sanoin, että ei se missään tapauksessa voi mikään helikopteri olla, sillä se tuli siihen täysin äänettömästi meidän yläpuolellemme. 
tämän sanottua, niin pyysin Mailaa antamaan kameran minulle ottaakseni kuvan sitä. En antanut kameraa, koska minusta oli mahdollisimman pian päästävä saareen, koska minua pelotti tämä valoilmiö. Nykäisin perämoottorin käyntiin ja lähdin ajamaan täyttä vauhtia kohti saartamme, mutta valopallo lähti seuraamaan meitä pitäen etäisyyden täydellisesti samana koko ajan ja pysyen tiiviisti kannassamme. Lähellä rantaa tästä valopallosta suunnattiin kolme sädettä kallea kohti. Ja silloin mua pelotti todella, koska mä, mä luulin, että ne hullut tulee nyt meitä kohti. Ihmeellistä asiassa oli, että kameran laskuri osoitti filmin loppuneen, vaikka olin varmasti vasta ladannut sen uudella rullalla. Ja tämä näytelmä kesti kaikkiaan 40 minuuttia, jonka ajan UFO oli seurassamme. The extraterrestrials observed with UFOs are said to come from many different universes and even from different dimensions. Thus they appear to us in dozens of different shapes. Perhaps the most common physical type has a large head, big eyes and is shorter than a human. Some of them seem to have an incredible ability to change their appearance as well as their form of speech. A lot of people who have seen them do not like talking about them and for UFO researchers too, they are a sensitive subject. The question is, what do they look like? You know, they're, they're like people on this planet. There's many kinds out there. Uh, some are 12 foot tall, some are 7 foot tall, some are 3 foot tall. I mean, there's all sizes and forms and shapes. I think the best thing to say is that the appearance they give to us is what they think we want to look at. We're really not seeing them in their true form. If they were to take off the, uh, the funny face or something like that, we might be scared to death of them. So, in my opinion, what they try to do is to present themselves to us in a form that's acceptable and not frightening. Now, there's also some, like the tall ones, have sort of a square head, you know. And then, of course, you've got some who look just like you and I. In fact, there's a group called the Nordics. I know of 18. And I'll bet there's at least seven more, so I say conservatively 25 extraterrestrial races. Uh, it's suspected that they may have as high as 26 secret bases throughout the southwest United States. UFOs first made contact with Osmo Liene in 1954, when he was out walking near his home in southwest Finland. Se UFO, johon joudumme tutustumaan lähikontaktissa, oli pyöreähkö, ehkä 5-7 metrin läpimittainen pallomainen alumiinin värinen laite, joka räimäsi ylitsemme keskellä peltoa ja veljeni kanssa jouduimme syöksymään ojaan, koska yhteen törmäyksen vaara näytti aivan varmalta. Olennot ilmestyivät meille kotiin keskellä yötä. Vierailuaika sinällään oli aika omituinen, kello oli juuri 12. Lyönyt ja väki tietysti jo vuoteissaan. Ja minä olin ainoa, joka olin hereillä. Oven auettua luulin, että jokin itämainen porukka, lähinnä niin nuoria poikia, olisi tullut väärään osoitteeseen. Heti sisään tultuaan he totesivat, että vai olet jo hereillä, sinua me tulemmekin haastattelemaan. Heillä oli laitteita myöskin mukana, lähinnä nykyisen pienen matkatelkkarin näköinen väline, jolla he sitten kyselyjen edistyessä näyttivät erinäisiä kuvia. Ja aina jonkun asian tullessa esille, siitä näytettiin kuvia. Tällä, tällä pienellä laitteella ja loppujen lopuksi kelattiin minun elämääni eteenpäin myöskin. Ja näin lyhyesti sanottuna ne tapahtumat, jotka minulle silloin kerrottiin, ovat tähän mennessä pitäneet hyvin paikkansa. Joskin tämän saadun tiedon viimeinen kuva on minun kannaltani vähän huonompi, koska siinä oli näytetty tapaturma, jonka And that it is time that world governments officially acknowledge... 
minulle kerrottiin, että se tähdistö, mistä he ovat kotoisin, näkyy maahan rykelmänä, sikermänä. been a major wave of UFO sightings in recent years in the former Soviet Union, including the Baltic Republics. Thanks to the new openness in those countries, UFO research has become very active and international. Several big UFO conferences have been held involving hundreds of scientists. In 1989, news of the landing of a reddish, ball-shaped UFO in a park in the town of Voronezh spread around the world. Out of the craft came creatures three meters tall. On seeing them, one eyewitness suffered a stroke and another was temporarily blinded. At about the same time, there were several more sightings of UFOs and humanoids in Voronezh. The eyewitnesses included many children. Recently in Voronezh, uh, some weeks ago, there were some sightings, UFO sightings and UFO landings also. And I'd like to stress especially that not only schoolboys, not only children were observing these strange landing and sightings and uh, humanoid, uh, human-like beings emerging from the uh, landed uh, spacecraft. There was a great number of reliable uh, witnesses among uh, adults also. It seems to me uh, that uh, now there is uh, some kind of wave of UFO sightings uh, over the uh, Soviet Union. And uh, to my estimation, this number is increasing. Abductions of people by UFOs has been a talking point in the United States for years. Among the first well-researched cases of abduction was that of fisherman Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker in October 1973. As darkness fell, an object 30 meters long landed close to the two men. Remarkable creatures emerged from the UFO. They were about 1.5 meters in height, hairless, with pincer-like hands. The men were scared out of their wits. Hickson started to beat the water with his fishing rod. Parker fainted in his arms. They were anesthetized and carried into the craft. When they reported the incident to the police, they were still close to hysterical. A conversation between the two men, secretly recorded at the police station, indicated that they really believed they had experienced a UFO kidnapping. An abduction at Sergi Pontoise near Paris in France in 1979 aroused widespread attention in France. In the early hours of the morning, three young men saw balls of light and one of them, Franck Fontaine, mysteriously disappeared. Fontaine reappeared a week later. The police investigated the incident thoroughly but could find no logical explanation for what had happened. Hypnosis revealed that the men had been in contact with a humanoid named Haurio, who warned them of a threat of world destruction. American Bud Hopkins has recently investigated hundreds of abduction cases. Because of the loss of memory often associated with such cases, Hopkins uses hypnosis on the people involved. In terms of finding new abduction cases, I'm running into them daily, people reporting uh, new cases. Sometimes these are uh, new only in the sense that they haven't uh, recalled them before, but I'm also, so in other words, they may be an old case I'm just hearing about for the first time, but I'm also running into very recent abduction incidents. I have one uh, that I've been working on that occurred in late August, uh, another one that occurred in June, and so forth. It's an ongoing phenomenon. There's no reason to say for sure that, you, that abductions are concentrated in the United States. Uh, it is a worldwide phenomenon. One young woman I've been working with uh, had a recent abduction actually in August in the United States, but in prior trips she was abducted in South America and Argentina, she's been abducted in Spain, and she's been abducted in various parts of the United States. 
I live in the United States, and therefore uh, I suppose I hear about more American cases. And since my books are widely uh, distributed in the United States, I'm, I'm hearing from more people. But I would guess if I were to go to Finland or any other place, and that uh, we were able to set up some way in which people could report their possible suspected abductions in a way that they would feel was supportive and trusting and so forth, that we would find huge numbers there too. I think this is a worldwide phenomenon. A growing number of abduction cases have come to light in Finland too. One case concerns Aino Ivanov. Because of her loss of memory, she was hypnotized. It appeared that her car had risen into the air in a cloud. Like many other contact people, Aino Ivanov is parapsychic. Mm -hmm tulossa siivikon ja puhoksen kouluilta autolla puolen yön jälkeen olin näillä kouluilla tuntiopettajana. Ja kun auto ylitti tämän Iijoen sillan, silloin näin edessäni sumuseinämän. Ja kun auto sukelsi tänne sumuseinämän sisälle, tapahtui jotakin merkillistä. Auto lähti nousemaan ylöspäin. Se kulki käsittääkseni huimalla nopeudella ja ensin, ensin oli aivan pimeä ja sen jälkeen oli tämmöinen niin kirkkaan sininen, sininen kenttä, auto meni sen läpi ja sitten tuli taas pimeä ja mä näin niin kirkkaita valopisteitä, jotka lähenivät ja loittonivat ja heräsin siitä, kun huomasin, että oli niin kuin vähän niin kuin hämärää ja tuota ja auto laskeutui tälle oudolle kameralle. Ja sitten mä aloin silmäilemään, että minkälaiseen paikkaan mä oon niin joutunut. Auto oli jonkunlaisessa laaksossa, joka puolella oli vuoret. Ja, tuota, ja mä vilkasin maata, se oli niin kuin punas, punasta kiveä tai soraa. Ja, ja huomasin, että se oli noin suurilla halkeamilla, jopa, jopa viiden sentin halkeamilla. Ja mä ajattelin mielessäni, että tässä paikassa ei, ei ihminen voisi elää, että ei ainakaan tässä vettä saisi. Sitten mä huomasin, että sieltä vasemmalta puolen sieltä vuoren kylkeä alas tuli kaksi henkilöä. Heillä oli suuri pää, eikä ollut hiuksia ollenkaan. Suuret silmät, jossa ei ollut niin pupille ja, ja tuota, pieni nenä ja, ja, ja suu, pieni suu. Ei ollut huulia ollenkaan ja heidän ihon väri oli aika vaalea. Tämän ensimmäisen matkan aikana musta otettiin sitten näytteitä. Oikeasta käsivarasta otettiin niin kuin viisi, viisi näytepalaa noin, noin, noin puolen sentin välein. Ja niistä on, on todistus tuossa. To prove the reliability of cases of contact, one of the most investigated abductions concerned the experience of the Hill couple in 1961. On September the 19th, 1961, late in the evening, Betty and Barney Hill were traveling by car on the east coast of the United States when they saw a bright object in the sky. After that, the Hills lost consciousness. When they came to, the UFO was gone and they had traveled nearly 50 kilometers south without being aware of it. Under separate hypnosis, the Hills both told how they'd been anesthetized and transferred to the UFO. Large-headed, large-eyed creatures had carried out medical tests on the couple, including taking a sperm sample from Barney Hill. One of the creatures had shown them a picture that gave the position of their home planet in relation to our universe. Phyllis Van Schlemmer is a contact whose space adventures are of the same type as Aino Ivanov's. I've had meetings with beings from other planets on UFOs twice. Both of them were completely different than the other. My first meeting was a UFO came down, it landed, I saw it, the door opened. For a moment I was very frightened and I said, no, this is an experience, I must go with it. So I boarded the craft and as I entered, I felt uh, the presence of someone in back of me that I didn't see and I entered into the inside of the craft and there were two beings in the craft. They were well over six feet, formed exactly like a human, uh, quite good looking. 
very, uh, appeared to be males. They had a metallic type of costumes on, did not seem to have any openings or fastenings of any kind. Very large crystal blue eyes, if you can call eyes crystal blue. And several years before, uh, in my office one day, appeared a space being. And it was similar to this being that these, these three beings or the two beings that I had seen that was on the ship. The trip was to the moon. They put this type of helmet on. It was like a plastic uh, helmet or plexiglass, and it had a rim all around it. It was clear. It was a, it was a double gla uh, plexiglass or plastic. It had little holes around. And when they put this helmet on me, it created an atmosphere around me that I could breathe because I had told them, look, we're on the moon. I want to go out. You can't bring me here and then not take me out on the moon. So they, they put this device on me, and as I walked, it seemed that the surface uh, kept it above ground, so uh, it, it functioned in this manner. I don't know how it worked. But they opened the door, and one took one hand, and one took the other hand, and they took me outside, and I was so happy because they were holding me. I was floating, and they were holding me down. They did not have problems walking on the moon. They did not float. They, they may have had something to hold them down. I'm, I don't know, because their boots were um, the same as their clothes. But I walked around for a while, and I wanted to walk, and they held me down so I could walk in the dust like this and kick it up and so forth. And uh, we walked around a while, and then they gave me the message, we have to go back. And they took me back in, and took me off the sh uh, took the device off me. I sat down and came back, and it was when I got off the ship and then went, went back into the house, it was 6.20 in the morning, and I had left at approximately 2 o'clock. I asked them how were they able to do this, because I think our astronauts took a couple of days to get there, and they said that we just did not understand, that we were not um, um, technically advanced enough to understand how to go, th go this fast. In evaluating cases of contact, it has to be remembered that the experiences are often described either under hypnosis or as parapsychological phenomena. The Finnish doctor of medicine and parapsychologist Rauni Lena Lukanen has experienced a UFO contact under hypnosis. Luonnollisesti ihmiset sanovat, että tämä on mielikuvitusta. Minulle se oli täyttä todellisuutta ja minusta se oli erittäin mielenkiintoista olla ufossa tutkittavana aivan kuin lääkärin vastaanotolla ja tavata olentoja, jonkalaisia en ole aikaisemmin nähnyt. Minä pystyin havaitsemaan kolme neljä olentoa, jotka olivat pieniä, noin 80 senttisiä, enkä pystynyt edes sanomaan, olivatko he miehiä tai naisia. Voitteko kuvailla, miten tuo teidän väittäminen ruumiista irtaantuminen sitten tapahtui? Toisin sanoen, miten te kohtasitte nämä ufot? Se on parapsykologinen ilmiö, jota on varsinkin USA tutkittu hyvin paljon. Kahdeksan miljoonaa ihmistä on kokenut ruumista poistumisilmiön siellä. Se on ilmiö, jota meidän psykiatriamme hyvin huonosti tänä päivänä tuntee. Mutta siinä ihminen tuntee, että hänen tajuntansa kohoaa hänen fyysisen ruumiinsa yläpuolelle. Ja se tajuntana lähtee mihin tahansa. Minun tajuntani näytti lähtevän ufoon. No millä tavalla juuri parapsykologia ja ufot sitten liittyvät toisiinsa? Parapsykologia on tiede, joka tutkii niin sanottuja yliluonnollisia ilmiöitä ja monien ihmisten mielestä ufot ovat yliluonnollisia. Parapsykologia tutkii muun muassa automaattikirjoitusta ja se voi tutkia rumista poistumisilmiöitä. Ja nämä ynnä telepatia ovat muun muassa tapoja, joilla ufoihin voidaan olla kontaktissa. South America, especially Brazil, has for long been among the world's most active UFO areas. The abduction of Brazilian lawyer Antonio Vias Boas is one of the most astonishing UFO stories. On October the 15th, 1957, Antonio Vias Boas was plowing on his farm when a 10-meter long object landed near him. To his surprise, four helmeted creatures came out of the UFO. They grabbed him by the arms and took him into the craft. He was subjected to medical experiments which climaxed when into the room stepped an almost human female creature. The creature undressed, and Antonio found her extremely beautiful. 
the woman invited Antonio to have sexual intercourse, the purpose of which was to cross a human with an alien being. Later, the extraterrestrial...